thank you very much for coming this evening to our uh, installation of Sheer Theater. Uh, the format is a Sheer, in the sense that the idea is to teach Torah, albeit in a somewhat unusual way. Um, we're hoping an attractive way. The topic is Judaism and Hellenism, and it's a play in four acts, followed by an actual Sheer by Rabbi Ezra Goldschmidt. Um, you should all have source sheets in front of you. Those are meant to help you track the Torah that's, uh, that's in at the play. You can look at it now, you can look at it afterwards. Either way, if you sign in with your email address, then you'll be able to receive uh, via email not only the source sheets in digital form, but also the actual script. What kind of, what kind of uh, theater actually sends you the script? You'll, uh, you'll be able to have that as well, and then you can recreate it at home uh, as, you, as you choose on Hanukkah. It might be a good uh, Hanukkah activity. Um, the setting for our play is a kosher restaurant in ancient Israel during the days of King Antiochus Epiphanes IV and the revolt of the Hashmonaim. You might notice certain anachronisms that we employ for the sake of our script. Our characters are Sarah, uh, a Jewish girl whose dating service has set her up with the young man she's with tonight, as well as uh, Akiva Konstantinos Isidorus. Uh, a Jewish boy who is a Hellenizer. He has left Judaism for Hellenism. Um, you will note that he's wearing a yarmulke because he's also Rabbi Ezra Goldschmidt, but you will have to imagine, suspension of disbelief, you'll have to imagine for the sake of the play that the yarmulke is not actually on his head. Um, I am playing a dual role. I'm the narrator among the, and I'm the waiter. So when I have the towel on my arm, at that point I'm the waiter. No towel, I'm the narrator part of the suspension of disbelief. Um, please note that uh, Alyssa has a cold, so um, please make sure to, uh, to avoid any noise to enable everybody to, to hear her. Without further ado, we begin when Konstantinos met Sarah. But how could this happen? I mean, my parents would kill me if they knew. I said he's a wannabe Greek, not a geek. <laughs> On the questionnaire, he checked Orthodox, but he obviously meant Eastern Orthodox, not Modern Orthodox. <laughs> sure, he's Jewish, but the kind of Jew who will walk into a restaurant called Everything in a Pita and order gyros and sublaki, not falafel or shawarma. I know, it's crazy. <coughs> he said his name was Izzy. Turns out it was short for the name he actually prefers, Constantinos Isidorus. <laughs> no, he's not cute. Well, maybe a little, but that's not the point. What do I do? Kira, gotta be kidding. Listen, here's what I need you to do. Call me in 10 minutes. I'll tell him an emergency came up. I'll pay for my food. I don't care. I can't believe this. Oh, okay, gotta go. Okay. I hope your friend is okay, Sarah. It, it, it's Sarah. And yes, she's doing better. I was just worried about her and wanted to check in. She may need my help later. Not so much later. Soon uh, even. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, I guess you can order. This menu isn't exactly what I had in mind. I was looking for something with, with feta cheese. It's a meat restaurant. There's no feta here. No mixing meat with milk. Got it. What'll it be? Sarah, what would you like? To go home. Sorry? <laughs> I said it's Sarah. And I think I'll have the hot open turkey with extra pita and a Greek salad. And you? I'm on the Hippocrates diet. I'd like something with raw vegetables and fruit. Wait, wait, do you have any boreki? If you mean borekas, yes, we have those. Fine, I'll, I'll have that. Very good. What's with that? What do you mean? That was hardly friendly service. Do they always treat customers that way? I know it was a shock for you, finding out that I'm more Greek than Jewish. <laughs> a little, yeah. I didn't deliberately hide my identity, you know. But I hope we can still have dinner together. I haven't talked to an old-fashioned Jew in a long time. 
Well, guess if you can tolerate an old-fashioned Jew like me instead of the Greeks you like to hang out with, we'll be fine. That concludes Act 1. Act 2, we'll see debates between Konstantinos, Sarah, and a third party on kashrut, politics, morality, and the soul. Why do you insist on keeping kosher anyway? It's what we've always done. Me, you, our ancestors for centuries, you know. But since you're being so forwarded about it, why don't you keep kosher anymore? I do, just it's not your kind of kosher. I've gone over to Greek kosher. What does that mean? Blessed by the priestess at the Temple of Athena? Passed between the fires before Hestia? Chanted upon by the oracle at Delphi? Your ignorance does not make your insults any more convincing, let alone logical. The Greek system of feasts isn't really so different from the Jewish ones. Greek meals involve pouring wine to the gods at the start, and often there are sacrifices. There are all sorts of intricate rules governing what the priest receives, what the other participants receive, what women may eat, and what's given to the gods. Gods have special food, ambrosia, which makes them immortal. People eat other food, which makes them mortal. And like Jews, they have foods that are taboo, or taboo in certain circumstances, like dog meat. So Greeks have a bunch of rules, fine. But if their system is so similar to ours, why is King Antiochus IV prohibited keeping kosher? I heard the great sage Eliezer was actually killed because he refused pork. They even offered him fake pork just so that people would think he had accepted the king's decree. And he refused, and they killed him. Listen, I'm not justifying it, but Antiochus did have grounds for condemning the kosher diet. Jews see their diet as a matter of superiority, saying that God has set them apart the, from the, Jew, the Jews to be virtuous and philosophical and superior. Have you read the letter of Aristeus with its glorification of Judaism? Or that odd work, Joseph, Joseph and, Ars and Asna? Some Jews say that kosher food makes Jews better than others. So why wouldn't the Greeks ban the practice? I did read Aristeus. That was the scroll with the whole explanation of how the Torah was translated into, into Greek, right? Mm -hmm. Did you read it? Do you think it was actually written by a non-Jewish member of the court of Ptolemy Philadelphus a century ago? Or do you think it was written by, a, it was a forgery by a Jew? I don't know what I believe about it, but I certainly did read it. The author meant it to be positive for Judaism, but I like it for its reconciliation of Judaism and Hellenism. The scroll's outlook is still that Judaism is greater than Hellenism, which is true. Again with this Jewish insistence upon supremacy. But back to my point. Aristeus makes up a crazy idea that keeping kosher is about eating creatures which have positive attributes and avoiding eating creatures that have negative attributes. As if keeping kosher isn't just some primitive taboo. Who says it's just some idea from one guy named Aristeus? Rabbi Yitzchak Arama and Rabbi Samson Rafal Hirsch will say the same thing. Yitzchak Arama? Samson Rafal, who? Hirsch. You can Google those them. <laughs> Guess you're not getting salad dressing, huh? Uh, not unless I try to get his attention for the next ten minutes. No. He's got something bothering him, I think. But I want to go back to what your beloved Greeks just did. The great Eliezer. Don't they have any morals at all? I mean, Greeks talk about virtue and morals. Take Epicurus. People say he wanted a just and ethical society. While well, killing people because they consider themselves superior can hardly be called just and ethical. Antiochus Epiphanes is neither hedonistic, epicurean, nor rational stoic. Hellenistic philosophy has nothing against Jews being Jews. Antiochus is just crazy. We call him Epimenes, the mad one. He was defeated in Egypt, and then, just when he heard that Jerusalem was in revolt, he flew into a rage murdering people and creating new laws to put down the rebellion. And all those Greeks who follow him, your friends, who kill Jews like Eliezer, they're just following orders? They are a Seleucid army, highly disciplined. Of course they follow orders. And as far as morality, what makes you think your friends, those Hasmoneans, are so wonderful and moral? You Hasmoneans are killing us in the streets. Of course we are. You Hellenizers are destroying the Jewish nation. You rich aristocrats support the Greeks, spread their culture, participate in the Olympic Games, import Greek practices into your lives and our communities. You have renamed Jerusalem in honor of your barbaric Antiochus. You have set up gymnasia. You have taken over the temple in Jerusalem. You are manipulating the priesthood. This is a war for survival. 
I wish I could say that leaving Jewish circles meant I had left behind this practice of having a total stranger insert himself into your table conversation. But no, Greeks do this too. Now I see why you have been so sour to me. You are one of those self-styled pietists. Very well, let us debate. You believe that those Hasmoneans are so wonderful and pure? If they were in power, they would make treaties with Sparta too. Their leader would crown himself king in the Greek style. They would employ Greek mercenaries in their armies. They would put Greek on their very coins. Your general point is correct. After you and your cronies are defeated, and they will be, the Hasmoneans likely will descend quickly into the practices of the Greeks. Their kings will be corrupt and become embroiled in power struggles. The sages will have difficulty in dealing with them. Their fall will begin at the moment they take the mantle of monarchy. As Kohanim, they should never seat themselves on the throne. But you prove nothing. However unethical and immoral, their misdeeds will be nothing compared to the murderous barbarity of the people you have adopted. Again, Antiochus Epiphanes is no representative of my people. Stop using him against me. Forget Antiochus then. Go back to Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Greek morality is about virtue, about reason, about moderation, about the pursuit of living well. What's wrong with that? Their system lacks God. It's all about human assessments of right and wrong and human needs. The lawgiver is a human being, not a deity. I'll get to you later. Wait, the Greeks have all of these temples. Of course they believe in God, or gods. What about Zeus and Venus, and, and I don't know, the one with the hammer, Thor, right? Thor is a cut-rate, dumbed-down Zeus with a silly weapon and an adolescent temperament. He'd hardly make a good movie character. <laughs> but as far as your main point, of course the Greeks believe in God. Socrates believed in multiple gods, and Aristotle believed in one God, just not your version of God. To him, God was the cause of all things, but had no personality beyond that. Why, he said, God is a living being, eternal, most good, so that life and duration, continuous and eternal, belong to God. For this is God. And your Maimonides will even adopt many ideas from this Aristotle. Maimonides? Is that some Greek sage? Sort of. Look him up on Wikipedias. <laughs> Enough about this Maimonides. If he will read too much Aristotle, that will be his downfall. But the bottom line is that your Greek version of God doesn't offer any sort of laws or morality. It's all about human beings, your personal aspirations and values. I believe in a creator who defines what is good and bad ethical and unethical. And where you believe in life in this world, I believe in an immortal soul. Do you believe you have a monopoly on the soul? Read Phaedo or The Republic. Read Aristotle's The Anima. They all talk about a soul. Those were ancient history. In our day, your philosophers are the Epicureans, the Stoics. They believe the soul is made of atoms. The soul is like the air we breathe. A far cry from our Jewish concept of a soul as God's animation of the body. An entity which is a portion granted from God above, in the image of God. Oh, my phone. Oh, oh gosh. Ho hold on one second. You wouldn't believe what's going on here. <laughs> the waiter is arguing with Izzy, with, with Constantinos, about morality and the soul. Yeah, I'm going to say this is, this is just too weird to walk away from. Yeah, I'll talk to you later. Okay, bye. Three takes place later in the meal, with Constantinos exploring more mundane topics of beauty and the material world. You mentioned Epicurus before. What do you know about his philosophy? Like you said, hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure, a true Apicurus. That's what I thought you thought. You should get out more. Epicurus was not about pursuing material pleasure. He wanted people to pursue satisfaction through intellectual tranquility, and his followers believed that virtuous behavior will lead to that intellectual tranquility. There's nothing wrong with this. Your rabbis oppose it only because Antiochus embraces it. That, and the fact that Epicurus believed in seeking satisfaction through your own determination of right and wrong instead of God's, and that this satisfaction is to be found here in this world instead of the next, that's heresy for us. And don't talk to me about pure intellectual pursuits. I know all about your Greek obsession with beauty in the body. I know what you guys do in those Olympic games. What, and Jews don't exercise? Abraham fights wars against nations and wins. Rebecca draws water for all, for all of those camels. Jacob rolls a large stone off a well. Moses sets up the Mishkan all by himself. The Book of Kings describes a place called Evan Hazokeleth. 
where youths competed in displays of strength. Isaiah doesn't depict ball playing. Is there not juggling and athletics in the temple itself during the celebration of the water drawing? Do the Jewish sages not say that one must be strong in order to commune with God? Is Torah debate not compared by the sages to a ball game? Do those sages not complain about ball playing on Shabbat, indicating that Jews are doing it? And to refer to your Maimonides again, will he not say that one must exercise and not study exclusively? Maybe so. But your Greeks pursue athletics for athletic sake, not for the sake of freeing the mind or improving one's health. You live the Hellenic ideal of a strong body and mind. You compete for titles and honors, and your bloodthirsty idea of sport is barbaric. And what of your version of sport? Our sport is part of service of God, and is thereby elevated. Explain that, please. First, we are taught as Jews to save our lives, maintaining our health. We shall live by these commandments, the Torah says. And our sages teach that a Jew must only live in a place where there is a physician. Further, we are taught to stay healthy in order to serve God, since one cannot serve God when he is ill. The ultimate redemption of our nation will depend upon unification of the body and soul in the service of God. Staying healthy means you eat properly and go for a walk. It doesn't explain the emphasis on strength. We also view the body as a gift from God. To be honored, we must keep it pristine. And there is nothing in the Torah about pleasure for pleasure's sake? There is. But even that is ultimately the service of God. Consider the sage who saves his pennies in order to purchase new fruit and enjoy their taste. Or the sage who travels the world to see divine creation, but all in order to praise God. Our sages teach that if one is learning Torah and he stops to admire a tree, then he is liable for death. And Rabbi Hirsch is going to explain that this refers to someone who admires the world for the sake of itself separating that beauty from recognition of God. So you're going to do the same things that we do. You're going to glorify sports just like we do, but it's pure because it's just about God? Not just like you do, not at all. Our path is elevated, superior, you might say. Your path, well, your own Claudius Galen, physician to the gladiators, will soon write with disgust of your wrestling schools. What, because you idolize the perfect form? We reject that material form. The prophet Shmuel was warned not to look at the material, but at the heart. It is far more than material form. The Greeks ideal, idolize ideal virtue, ideal music, even ideal mathematical proportion. They, we, envision the existence of another world, the Garden of Eden, if you will, in which exist perfect forms of every entity you can imagine. Not just physical objects, but intangibles, colors, geometric shapes, mathematical concepts. Those ideal forms are echoed every time you witness something attractive, and your soul sings with it. To quote Plato from Phaedrus, when he sees any earthly beauty is transported with the recollection of the true beauty, he would like to fly away, but he cannot. He is like a bird fluttering and looking upward and careless of the world below, and he is therefore thought to be mad. As Plato said in his symposium, <coughs> only in contemplation of beauty is human life worth living. Wow. And you said all that about me? You are a charmer. Don't kid yourself. I said you could be attractive, were you not of such poor character. The poor character charge rings hollow, coming from a man who thinks life is empty until one finds the perfect mathematical concept. Don't act as though beauty is neglected in Judaism. The Jewish sages specifically describe the matriarchs, like Sarah. It's Sarah. Whatever. Like Sarah, as being of incredible beauty. And what is your definition of hidr mitzvah, if not the pursuit of beauty? You want your korbanot and priests to be free of blemish. Your priests are forever campaigning to raise funds to upgrade the temple menorah to gold. And you are willing to pay many times the value of an etrog to be able to use it for a mitzvah. For the sake of God's mitzvah, yes. And it's not about the beauty, but about the effort of beautification. Whether I have a flawless etrog or a bruised one is not as important as the fact that I tried my best to find a flawless one. It is in the effort and investment and uniquely in the service of God. Once again, the difference between your culture and mine is that yours glorifies human beings and mine glorifies the service of the divine. Are you ready for the check? <sighs> Not just yet, thank you. Do you have any Turkish coffee, perhaps? And some baklava? I'll check. We move to our final act in which we learn why the sages were so concerned about the influence of Hellenism.
You know, I'm amazed you're having this discussion with me at all, honestly. Because you've allied yourself with people who want to destroy Jews, because you reject our religion, because you're snide and insufferable. Well, there is that. But also the fact that we're sitting here talking about Aristotle, Epicurus, Plato. I mean, would it ruin your chances at a shiva if anyone overhears us? We have nothing to fear from your false philosophies. It's not as though there's any ban against learning them. Ah, there will be a ban one day. I'm sure of it. They'll never ban Greek itself. The sages admire the language too much and consider it close to Hebrew. They even call it the beauty of Yefet. But they hate our ideas and they fear them. What do you know from what the sages think? I tried Yeshiva, you know. I went by the name of Akiva back then. They lectured us on my very first day about how studying Greek ideas would waste time from Torah study and even how it would lure us into thinking like the Greeks and siding with them against other Jews. That was enough for me. They weren't wrong, evidently. I didn't become a Hellenizer because I studied something foreign. Then what led you astray? What is in this Hellenism for you? Precisely the fact that it's not foreign. I don't see such a difference between Hellenism and Judaism. Look at what we've talked about. Food taboos on both sides. Morality on both sides. Virtuous behavior on both sides. The only difference, to you, God is the authority. The soul is there on both sides, and we just debate the debates. And where Greeks have beauty, Jews have hinder. Greeks have exercise, Jews take care of the body God gave them. Even the methods of the sages for interpreting dreams are the same as those of the Greeks. What do you mean? The rabbis in the yeshiva talked about someone who has a dream and sees a particular word or image, and said to interpret it based on hominids, like one who sees a reed, which is called kane will acquire wisdom, because the word for acquisition is also kane. And the oracles do the same. The sages use gematria and all sorts of wordplay, and so do oracles. The sages explain certain dream images as negative, like the weasel, and so do the oracles. And even in study, the sages have a method called saris hamikra vidarshehu, moving words around in biblical sentences in order to solve problems in them. And the Greeks have the same method, called anastrophe. So what are you saying? You became a Hellenizer because it was similar to Judaism? That's exactly what he's saying. It's what they all say when they try to lure us away from Judaism. We're so similar. Just change this a little. Tweak that a little. You can join the mainstream and be like everybody else. No wonder the sages are so concerned. Their idolatrous differences are disguised behind external similarities. It's no disguise. We truly are similar. Far from it. And it's now time to close up here. It's only 8.20. Yes, but we have a class in here next. You ought to stay. You might learn something. Very well, then. That's been enough fun for tonight, I suppose. Good, sir. I hope you don't expect much of a tip. Sarah, <laughs> would you like to get together again sometime? Exploring these ideas with you has been quite an entertaining exercise. I think maybe we should go through the shot then for this one. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're going to give Rabbi Goldschmidt a minute to exit stage left, <laughs> and then uh, he'll uh, resume with the, uh, with the shear. Where, where is this? Uh, we have a known problem that uh, in uh, our more classical Torah study, and it's that back when we were in day school, we often received uh, simpler frameworks of more profound lessons that are contained in the Torah. And that, that was necessary, perhaps, for our earlier stages in life, uh, when we weren't re yet ready to hear more. Uh, but one of the biggest obstacles for us is to graduate past that simpler point, and as we get older and progress uh, to a deeper level of understanding, we have to be able to, to do that, to be ready for it, to, uh, to accept that notion. And the same is true for the themes of Hanukkah. Uh, to be sure that all the things you learned in school or uh, that you've heard about Hanukkah are true. I, I think uh, most popularly we know about, I could say, the Hebrew pronunciation now, Antiochus, and uh, the Syrian Greeks, so they persecuted us. Uh, they forbade the study of Torah, observance of many of the mitzvot, and uh, they defiled and corrupted the Beit HaMikdash. Uh, that's, all of that is true, and it's what's most clearly, I guess, establishes them as the bad guys in our story. But uh, as my alter ego, Constantinos, pointed out, we shouldn't assume that Antiochus' attitudes towards us was reflective of, you know, all of Greek thought. Uh, Greek culture did, in, in a practical sense, allow this to happen. And uh, indeed, it created the society in which people like Antiochus were able to commit their atrocities. Uh, but if that's all we have going for us in our schema that we've developed of Jews versus Greeks, so we can run into a number of problems. Uh, 
to start, we, we all know in one form or another that, that a, a flaw in, in the application of a certain theory or, or ideology is, does not necessarily indicate a, a flaw in the theory itself. Um, among ourselves, just to use an example, so I think we, we can all agree that there's plenty that, that has a whole we can work on in the practice of our Jewish values and in our Jewish outlook, but that doesn't necessarily indicate in any way that there's a flaw in our outlook, in, in our values. I, w I would hope that that's not the case. So, similarly, if, if all we do is emphasize our concrete struggle with, with the Greeks, the, the war, the persecution, and all of the things that Antiochus did to us, we could fall into the trap of thinking that our conflict it doesn't run any deeper than that. Um, but when it comes to the Greek worldview, something that we need to keep in mind is that we do in fact have issues, we do in fact have conflicts on an ideological level, and uh, that should not be overlooked, it shouldn't be oversimplified. And uh, I was hoping that the play hopefully fleshed some of those ideas out. Uh, additionally, there are areas in which we can learn from the Greek's legacy. And therefore, if we don't take time, as you're coming into Hanukkah, to think about the roots, the ideological roots of this conflict, so we risk one of two things. So you could, on the one hand, unknowingly accept the problematic aspects of Greek culture, of Greek thought into our worldview. There are instances where I think we can see that happening. And on the other hand, somebody could take the other extreme and throw out the baby with the bathwater. They could be too aggressive in their rejection of Greek contributions to society. And these, es these issues, then, they're, they're no less relevant today, and uh, they're worthy of exploration. So I don't have the time or the expertise to discuss all the conflicts and to substantiate uh, what our claims are exactly against Greek philosophy, against Greek ideologies, but uh, I hope the play, the play gave you an idea of how far-ranging that might be. But just for a, a taste of this notion, so I just wanted to explore a little bit using broad brushstrokes, and I am uh, basing uh, just the, the short Torah that I want to share with you uh, with an, based on an insight that I heard from uh, Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein on the uh, subject. So uh, Rabbi Lichtenstein, he notes that we can be begin to see the conflict uh, more clearly uh, if we examine the differences between one of our stories, one of our books, and a, a drama or a, a, uh, a work of, of literature of the Greeks. If you take our book in Tanakh of Sefer Eov, and you compare that to the Greek myth, uh, to whatever extent you're familiar with it, we'll talk a little bit about what exactly the story was, but the Greek myth of Prometheus. Um, Lichtenstein, he, he draws a, a unique comparison and contrasting uh, of these two works. So as I'm sure you all are familiar with, the basic storyline of Eov is that you have a righteous man, he seems to be undeserving of any misfortune, and all of a sudden he loses his entire family, he loses all of his wealth, and he's stricken with a horrible, painful disease. He spends the rest of the book questioning God's ways, and he contemplates with friends how, the famous question, how can bad things happen to good people? In the end, so God comes out, min hasa'ara, from out of the whirlwind, whirlwind, and he essentially tells Eov that, Eov, you're out of your element. He says, were you around when I created the world? Do you honestly presume to have the slightest idea of how I run things? In short, there's much more in those prakim about that, but. God is ultimately right in what he does. That's the message of the end of Sefer Eov. And we have a shortcoming in being able to comprehend his ways. And God's ways ultimately are beyond us. There's a Pasuk in Yermiyahu that says, Tzadik Ata Hashem, you are righteous, God. That's a given. Ki ari velacha, even when I express claims against you. Ach mishpatim adaber osa, but I'm nevertheless going to present charges against you. Why does the ways of the wicked why do the ways of the wicked prosper? And why are the betrayers secure? We're not prohibited, like your Miyahu, we're not prohibited from asking those questions. And we can never claim, however, and that's what your Miyahu was alluding to at the beginning of his statement, we can't be the ultimate arbiter of what is moral, what is good. God is always above us, and therefore his demands of us are always viewed as as a default. They are legitimate. They are they're, they're fine and, and they're warranted, irrespective of our ability to comprehend them. And ultimately, we can't comprehend God. As we said earlier, God's response to Eov is that, that I'm in a different league. I'm, I'm a member of a, uh, you know, I'm on a totally different wavelength than you. Don't presume to even try to figure out the way that I work. So that's the story of Eov. And if you take, Rabbi Lichtenstein says, the, on the other hand, the Greek myth of Prometheus, uh, you can see a very different notion of, uh, of what God is like. So uh, some of you might be familiar with the Prometheus story. I know that uh, in New York, Rockefeller Center, they have a big statue of Prometheus uh, by the water fountain. 
this guy holding a, a flame in his hands. So uh, what's, the, what's the deal with that? What's the story behind his, uh, uh, I guess, what is the mythology for Prometheus? So I'm discussing this in broad forms, uh, not only because I'm incre incredibly unfamiliar with, uh, with what Greek mythology has to say about the topic, I'm not an expert by any means, but also, in the, in the little research I've done, there are numerous conflicting accounts of what exactly Prometheus did and did not do. Uh, but in a nutshell, I'm going to just painting with broad brushstrokes as to what the Prometheus legend is, is uh, Prometheus was one of the titans. He was a lower level god, whatever that means. He worked for Zeus, who is the, the king of the gods. Now Zeus, he wants to keep the human beings, keep all of humanity in an inferior position. And because of that, he kept certain things top secret. And among them, he kept as a secret the ability to make fire. What Prometheus did was, somehow he tricked Zeus, he stole the secret of fire, and he brought it down to humankind. So according to some traditions also, Zeus actually did more than, uh, sorry, Prometheus, he did more than just bring fire. He didn't just steal the secret of fire and give it to mankind. He also gave them, I think, uh, which fire can serve in some ways as a representative of the arts of civilization such as writing, mathematics, agriculture, medicine, and science. And as a punishment, Zeus, who apparently could not reverse what had happened, he chains Prometheus to a large stone where he's stuck for the rest of his eternal, and because he's somewhat of a god, his immortal life. He's also tortured regularly. There's a bird that comes and eats his liver once every day, but because he's immortal, his liver grows back, and then he has to go through the torture every day. And uh, according to some traditions, uh, Hercules comes ultimately one day and he frees Prometheus from his uh, prison. Uh, none of those uh, elements matter for our purposes. But what you have essentially is Prometheus is the tragic hero of the, uh, of the story. He tricks Zeus. He gives mankind the tools that are meant exclusively for the gods. And while chained to the rock, if you look in certain plays that uh, describe what Prometheus did, he sings and he declares his objection to Zeus's punishment. And through that, he expresses his own personal sovereignty, his own personal independence. So Rav Lichtenstein says that this story is an example of the message that Greek culture gave to the world. So obviously, there is, we're, we're painting again with broad brushstrokes, as we mentioned in the play. There are many different conceptions within the Greek worldview of how many gods there are. There's the issue here of, obviously, polytheism. But not everyone was of the same mindset. But in any event, what you do have, again, in a general sense, you have the beginnings of what we might want to call humanism. Nowadays, that term humanism, it's, it's more loaded than perhaps uh, I mean it. Uh, nowadays, when we say humanism, we mean a very secular, atheistic approach that makes man the, uh, I suppose, the, the ultimate, the, of the highest stature of all beings that, that are in existence. Humanism nowadays does that by negating the concept of God or gods or whatever it is, that there, there are none. Humans are the only ones out there. But what the Greeks did was they, they basically made the gods like people. Without the limitations that Judaism has, they gave God emotions and human failings, and ultimately, they, by doing that, they subject the gods to our judgment by putting, putting gods or God on a very similar level to you and I. God is still in their eyes. He's God. He's more powerful, and perhaps he's smarter than us. But then the difference, and this is crucial, the difference is one that is a, a quantitative difference. It's no longer a qualitative difference as to what the difference is between humans and God, or gods. The God of the Greeks would never be able to tell an Eo that he's totally out of his element, and that he can't possibly comprehend God's ways. The God of the Greeks can do bad things, can do wrong things, and uh, that's something that's a part of their worldview. Now, again, this isn't to say that you and I can't question God. We saw Yermiahu did it, Eo did it. That's not where this difference ultimately manifests itself. But rather, the difference between ourselves and the Greeks is the way that we look at God as a whole. That difference in outlook, it changes one's perspective immensely. Just to, to quote in the exact language of Rav Lichtenstein, he says that this leads us to the obliteration in Greek culture of a category which is fundamental to us, commandments. In our world, the man sees himself first and foremost as someone who is commanded, as the bearer of a divine mission, as carrying upon his shoulders a task which must be fulfilled. That we are a mitzvah, that we are somebody that's commanded to serve God. This conception is generally lacking in the classical Greek world of Plato and Aristotle. There certainly exists a type of religious consciousness, but religion is perceived as the aspiration to re realize certain ideals rather than as obeying commands. So the Greeks, they did advance the world beyond an immature notion of God as a vengeful and frightening being. That is something that we, we do owe to them, uh, despite the, the flaws that we just mentioned. 
they very much helped the world as a whole in losing, I guess, what we would call an overwhelming sense of yiras ha'onish, of being of irrational fear of punishment. We, we have yiras ha'onish. We view that as a lower level in our service of God. But uh, there were people in the world out there that not only had yiras ha'onish, but also an irrational yiras ha'onish, uh, a fear of punishment that in no way corresponded or was tied to any, any rational understanding of what moral conduct is and isn't. There is a concept in their system of morals, it's humanly defined, and that, that's something that they and the gods are keeping. And because of that, when they bring that kind of thought into the world, so things like human sacrifice, you know, to avoid God's wrath, that's not viewed as much as being as sensible as it was before the Greeks came along. But by getting rid of that, a problem was that they fell short, they left a vacuum. They, they didn't fill that vacuum of getting rid of yiras ha'onesh, of getting rid of that irrational fear of punishment. They didn't replace it with a yiras ha'romos, of a fear of, not a fear, but an awe of God, an awe of God's greatness. And because of that, when you don't have that at all, then basically there's no, there's no importance to being a God. And the entire notion of a mitzvah, of a commandment, that Jews you know, believe and hold dear, entirely disappears. Because ultimately you would ask yourself, if you were somebody that felt followed the Greek way of thought, so why should I bother serving a God? Why should I bother doing mitzvahs for a God that all in all is basically like me? And that was the way that they thought. And that's where the debate, I think, ultimately lies. That manifests itself in, in many ways, a lot of the examples you saw tonight. Um, but again, let's, let's not, uh, that's something that I, I want to emphasize, I think that was a point of this play also, is that we should never forget their, uh, the contributions that they made to civilization. Those are important, they're valuable. They brought to us mathematics, tremendous uh, advances in mathematics, art, an appreciation of beauty, popularizing, this is, I think, also extremely important, the, no the very notion of, of finding ideas uh, and f falling in love with ideas, of uh, being a, a person that is a, to use the language of philosopher, somebody that's constantly in that realm, that that's something that they view as a passion, and something that they do in their life. So. Those are, those are cornerstones of the modern world. Those are things that we view very, we hold them dear, we think that they're important. And they come in some way from that humanistic world view that we mentioned earlier. If nothing is, if the Greeks are thinking that nothing in the world is beyond them, and that means that the world, it operates by certain established rules, it, it, it operates by certain laws, and that therefore we can figure things out. That means we can, if we're fueled by our vision of how the world works, so we can master that world with our innovations and, and our ideas, and we can bring humankind to great heights. In that notion of mastering the world, that is something that the Jews as a whole, we believe in. That's something that we agree with, that's something that we hold dear, we, we want to, or do as a is something that God commands Adam HaRishon to do, to subjugate the land, to make it work for you. Ultimately, though, what is our job? Our job is to make it work for us, by that mean, work for God. Just a few minutes ago, to talk about Greek culture and Greek uh, advances and what they've given us. Uh, you were witness to one element of the Greeks' love of ideas, the drama. The drama was, according to many sources, uh, among them Aristotle, uh, it was invented by somebody named Thespis the Greek. He was the first person ever in history to appear on stage as an actor and play a character in a play, somebody that is speaking in a voice that is besides that of himself. Hence this evening I was a thespian, Thespis, thespian, right. That kind of innovation that comes from that love that the Greeks had of a greater, a greater sense of love than the rest of the world of the arts and communication of ideas. And along those lines, we have already this, an allusion to this idea in the Torah. When Noah gives a bracha to two of his children, he says, Yat Elohim la Yefes, Yishkon He says, God will give beauty to Yefes, and he will dwell in the tents of shame. He, Yefes, will dwell in the tents of shame. Yefes was ultimately, he was the, the forerunner, he was the forefather of Yavan of what will ultimately become Greece. And I think we have to understand this as that wasn't just a blessing that Noah gave Yefes, but it was also guidance. The gifts that the Greeks give us, they'll ultimately, and that they ultimately give to mankind, that, that's only praiseworthy when they dwell in the tents of shame. Our forefather. Shame, we come from shame. When all the tools and ideas that they've given us are properly focused in service to what we have a, has a proper conception of who God is, so then that's when Yavan's beauty, that's when it can really be true and, actu and real. And to, feel, to focus just in closing on the, on, the, on the beauty aspect for the moment, we talked about beauty earlier in the, in the skit, but I remember uh, once visiting a, a family friend and they had, when you come to the front door, when you come to their, uh, uh, as you walk into their house, they had on the right side, they had a, a mirror 
right by the front door, and it had inscribed on it a pasuk that we're all familiar with. It's at the end of Eishas Chayel, something we sing every Friday night. Sheker hachin v'hevel yofi is what it said on this mirror, right? Uh, false is gracefulness, and uh, nothingness, beauty is nothing. So I, I got a laugh out of that when I saw that pasuk. Any any reason why? Any, anybody have an idea why? Because it's over a mirror. mirror. Right. If you, if you believe in that statement, why bother having a mirror at all? Right. Um, so I saw an idea of, of the uh, the Vilna Gon that I think might uh, first of all explain the role of this mirror, and also I think give us uh, in some ways a good summation of what we discussed tonight. Uh, we normally understand that phrase, Shekhar Achim Behevel Hayofi, as a unit in and of itself. We usually think so. A woman that is uh, graceful, that has chain, uh, or she has yofi, she has beauty. So those are sheker, those are hevel, those are nothing. Isha yiras Hashem. But if you have a woman who's not like those women, but a woman who cares about her beauty, but she is a, a yira, she is a yirei shamayim. She's somebody that that is in awe and fear of God. So then he tisalal, she will be praised. The Vilna Gaon says that's not the point of the verse at all. He is a reference to a woman that has the totality of all of those things. If you have a woman that is a Yirat Shemayim, then Sheker Achein Vehevel Hayofi, that gracefulness and beauty, those are worthless and false on their own merits, but take Isha Yirat Hashem, take a woman who is somebody that truly is in awe of God, then that woman, that same woman, that has all of those attributes, if she's a Yirat Shemayim, then he says Salah. Then not only is she praised for her Yirat Shemayim, for the fact that she's in awe of God, but also her Chein, also her Yofi, also her beauty. These are all things which are ultimately used in service of God. So obviously, uh, I just wanted to close that this is not your run-of-the-mill class, and I, I think, or at least I, I hope, that uh, channeling that tool of the Greeks, that tool of drama, that, that itself was a way of showing how Greek culture could and should be used, and I hope that, uh, that we should merit this Kanaka to understand the roots of the conflict that we battled and that we continue to battle to this day on an ideological level, and that through that we should truly grasp and celebrate our identity as a Jewish nation. Thank you very much for coming. If there are any questions, I'll try and answer. Rabbi Thorchino would be probably the best person to ask. Mm -hmm. he, he's the one that wrote the script. If you, I'm sure you, you saw from the, uh, from the play itself, it took a lot of the work, took a lot of brilliance. But uh, if anyone has any questions, you can speak to me after, I suppose. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.